partners, especially in the beginning, uh, where you're able to really have this bilateral relationship where one of you does one thing and the other does the other, even though there's some crossover is probably the most affordable way of going about it. Now, I've had a lot of partnerships and some of them have been great and some of them have been a complete dismal failure. Uh, I had somebody say to me once that um, business partnerships are like marriage without love. You'll actually spend, uh, if you're first building the business, more time with that partner than you will with your significant other. How do you choose the right partner? Welcome to the Networking Star Podcast, where we talk with some of the most innovative entrepreneurs and thought leaders out there. I am your host, Jeffrey Boyle, and today I am joined by Jamie Gruber. Uh, he has a very interesting story. He's in the Dominican Republic right now, and I'm just going to read this so I, I get it right. He said, quit my job, built a business, invested in real estate, moved to the Dominican. And as the host of the Tribe of Millionaires, I'm super excited to have you on here. Thanks, well, Jamie. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. So you are in the Dominican Republic, and I think that, um, you know, I think COVID kind of expedited that. We just got back from living in Costa Rica. It's a pretty amazing world now that you can be doing business all across the, the world. Why Dominican Republic and, and what's it been like as a business person? We, a few years ago when I had my day job, so I was an executive with Progressive Insurance, uh, a vision that I had was to travel three plus months with my family anywhere. So at the point at which I quit my job and sort of built the businesses intentionally to be able to not have to be in one specific place, we chose the Dominican because my wife is originally from here. So it was kind of our first destination okay. was like, you know what? She still has extended family here. She immigrated when she was 12-ish to Boston, but still has extended family. Uh, Spanish is her first language. So it was sort of a... I don't know, a benefit to have her uh, along for the ride. She knows the country, she knows the language, she knows the culture. So it was a bit of a cheat code for us. Well, I think that uh, the beautiful part about being an entrepreneur is you can truly uh, work towards your your passion and the ability you have young kids, the ability to be there. That really is, I think, a dream that so many people have, but people are afraid to pursue that. What do you tell people? I, I know you, you, you know, your pattern was corporate yeah. America, uh, then you started to invest, invest in real estate, and then now you're really living a dream, a dream life. What do you tell that that person that maybe feels that they're locked into a corporate America job? I understand them first and foremost. I mean, I spent 21 years in a company, building a career, and all of that that I thought I wanted. But honestly, as I as I reflected back over different milestones along the way, I realized it was never truly what I wanted. It wasn't even that I wanted to be in real estate or whatever. It was just not this. And it took me a while, a long time, to figure out what my path might be. And I think I found it with podcasting and some of the stuff I do in real estate and so on and so forth. I think, I think the first thing I would say to somebody is they have to sit down and really map out for themselves what they want life to look like. So create a vision. I, this is like the clarity phase. So if you're somebody who's 35, 45, 55, whatever it is, sort of in that midlife, making six figures, wife or husband at home, and it's like, man, I'm trapped here. I've got those, those golden handcuffs on. The best thing for me, step one, was saying, all right, well, what would life look like if I could just design it? If I won the Powerball tomorrow, what would I do with my life, right? Like not go travel. You do that for a year or two, but it gets boring. You're going to want to do something. So how would I spend my days? Write that down as your vision. Once you've done that, I think that the next thing is you have to really work on shifting your identity identity toward whatever that vision is. So if, you're, if your goal is to be an entrepreneur or a real estate investor or whatever it might be, if that's in your vision or a world traveler or a nomad, then you really have to identify with that version of you that's coming in the future. And I think the last thing that's important is you need to get around people that represent who you're becoming not around people that represent who you've been. I call that my remember when versus imagine when people. So remember when are the folks that you have right now, your family, your friends, those that would say to you when you even mention the idea of quitting a six-figure uh, six job, like, are you crazy? Those are remember when. They're afraid for you. So they're going to want to keep you in place. Imagine when doesn't care who you've been, who you are. They just see who you see as you uh, in the future and they hold you accountable to that. So I think clarity is first, build confidence toward a new identity and find the right community for you. It's a really great experience, I think, for a lot of people to kind of set their mind free to do what you're talking about. Imagine you won the Powerball. 
uh, more people can imagine that because it doesn't require effort, yeah. but it's still a wonderful exercise to be able to go through it and start saying, how did I, how do I imagine my life becoming? And something I used to say to people when we were in Costa Rica was true freedom is working when you want, where you want, with who you want. And uh, that doesn't come, uh, it doesn't come typically with a traditional job. You really have to be able to, if you want true freedom to work, how, when, and where, and more importantly, with who, it has to be as an entrepreneur. So how do you, uh, you know, you, you've talked about setting out that path, setting out that goal. How is the, you know, as a 21 years in a corporate America job making great money, how do you get the person to take that leap from security towards freedom? The, the number one thing that folks need to do, and uh, guilty, you go through you know, primary school, college for what, 17 years. Then you take on a career for 15, 17, 20 yeah. years, whatever it is, 25 years. Those are big swaths of your life. So the, the conditioning now is, all right, I got to figure out what I'm going to do for the next 20 years, right? Like I got I to gotta get this right because yeah. now I got a mortgage, I got kids, I got all these responsibilities. So we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to make a move that's right and accurate and the right thing for me, as opposed to simply trying and iterating. If you're 20 years old or if somebody's 20 years old and they came up to you or me and said, I don't know what to do with my life, the advice would be simple. Just try a bunch of stuff. See what you like, see what you don't like, and you'll figure out the path. But at 35 or 40 or 45, we lose the ability to give ourselves permission to do that. It's the same thing. I always say this, like whatever you start out with, I don't believe you end with when you're going the entrepreneurial route from the traditional employment route. And what I mean is you're going to be version six, seven, eight point oh, whatever it is of you, but you're not until you start at version one point oh. I mean, I think about me, right? My vision, my vision to, to travel three months a year with my family was going to be because I invested in multifamily real estate. That was going to be the path. That was it. Buying mom and pop, uh, workforce housing, multifamily real estate by myself or with a partner. That was the path. And then as I got in that world, I learned about the interactive side of real estate. So I started a meetup group, a networking group that brought me deals and actually brought me capital as well. But I really liked the brand building side. So I was like, all right, well, I started with this real estate vision. I'm going to be this operator. And then I learned I don't love operations. I love the networking, capital raising, uh, investor relations part. That's fun. That's my personality. But I pivoted to like meetup guy. I had this, this syndicate of meetups around the country called Multifamily and More. That was the business I went into and I started to build a brand. And then that led into building a brand around more like mindset and self-actualization and so on and so forth while real estate was still there, but in the areas that I wanted to be in. In other words, I was partnered up now in a syndication firm where I could do the things that I'm great at and it gave me the ability to do it from anywhere as opposed to this initial vision that I'm just going to buy a bunch of multifamily. And as time went on, the podcast came up and I built a community called Emerge and I, I, you know, people join that community. That's a business for me. So it's, unless you start something that feels like it's aligned with what you're trying to become, you're not going to know what truly is the thing that's aligned with who you're going to become. And I'm still not there. I never will be there. I've learned that. W2 teaches you, you got to do this to your 65. But in the entrepreneurial world, like the rate of change, the rate and pace at which you grow is exponential and it's constantly evolving. But we don't do it because we fear failure. And more importantly, we feel being judged for that failure, especially if we take a big leap at 42 and throw away 200 grand or whatever it might be. That's the hard part. So I hope I answered your question, yeah. but I think, I think the, sure, the answer is you've got to start. You've got to start. And I, and I think that's the main, the main thing that you have to go through. I, I watched this great reel, and I uh, wish I could say exactly what it was, but it was a, a guy who, who mentors a lot of young entrepreneurs. And one of the things that he told them, just have a very successful first day, set a goal of waking up at a specific time, set a goal of working, for, working out for a specific amount of time, and then set the goal of going to bed at a specific time without watching television before you go to bed. And the young entrepreneur said, well, what else? He said, just that, have a success tomorrow. And that success will then build another success and another success, exactly what you were talking about right there. And so, you know, as one of the things that you said also is that you really like a certain aspect of your business. So how do you then uh, fill in your gaps of the things that you don't like to do, especially if, if you're a brand new entrepreneur and you can't afford to bring on a bunch of employees? In the very beginning, you're going to have to do. 
whatever it is you're going to have to do in your business, right? There's, there's the, there's the, I do, we do, they do sort of thing that you've got to go through. Meaning, you know, you're starting something, you're going to have to learn it all. Like, you know, I don't like, I do a lot of stuff on YouTube or Instagram. Like I don't, I don't want to learn the back end. That's not my thing. I'd rather just create content, but you got to learn it. But as time goes on, and, yeah. and honestly, even in today's world where, where we were talking about it, virtual assistants in the Philippines or Mexico, like it's so inexpensive. And if anything, you should be leveraging your W-2 to pay for things that you know, are going to eventually be you know, how you systematize your way out. But that's another point. But you're going to have to do it in the beginning. But beyond that, I think there's a lot of power in partnership. If you're not going to hire initially, you can partner. And I always talk about these three these three like gifts that people have, one of the three is you. You're either an analyzer, you're either a, a connector, or you might be an integrator. So I think those three skills or those three natural sort of ways of being, one of them applies to everyone that's listening, me, you, everyone. That one aspect is the value you bring to a partnership, either to replace the person who's the principal of that, of that company and you have a, the similar, so if you're a connector, they're a connector, they want to elevate up. So you can replace them as the connector or they're missing that energy. They don't have the analyzer. So in the real estate business, I think about that. If you're the type of person who knows how to, who knows how to optimize a spreadsheet and deep dive analysis, all you need to be taught now is how to do that for a multifamily deal or a self storage deal or whatever. But that skill and that, that drive and that natural ability has so much value in the marketplace. So I learned early on, and I did get a partner who did more of the back end, if you will, and I was more front end, but there was still a lot of crossover. But as I joined a syndication firm, it was really with my connector energy only. I don't do anything with asset management, with acquisitions, other than we consult and talk as a team, obviously. But that is not my day-to-day -day role, and I don't want it to be. There's guys that do that that are amazing. So I think you find those alternative energies, and you partner with them, hire them, whatever you can afford to do in order to build your way out of it. Yeah, I think partners, especially in the beginning, uh, where you're able to really have this bilateral relationship where one of you does one thing and the other does the other, even though there's some crossover, is probably the most affordable way of going about it. Now, I've had a lot of partnerships, and some of them have been great, and some of them have been a complete dismal failure. Uh, I had somebody say to me once that um, business partnerships are like marriage without love. You'll actually spend... Uh, if you're first building the business, more time with that partner than you will with your significant other. How do you choose the right partner? I think there's a couple of variables. I think one, you got to choose people that that are opposing in terms of skill set. So if you are a, you're the outgoing gregarious one, don't partner with another outgoing gregarious person. <laughs> Find somebody who has the opposite skill set. But the other part is value alignment. That's the key. And like you, I've had partnerships go well. I've had partnerships go bad that we had aligned values and we were clear on these roles, right? Like it's just, it just is. It's, it's like anything, right? Like in anything that you do, there's some things that are great and there's some things that may not be great. And you kind of take that chance. But I think those two things at least set you up for the best chance of success. Opposing skill set, same values. And then from there, talk to an attorney, get a great operating agreement in place between you and your partner. Make sure you yeah. are planning for the divorce because it's inevitable one way or another. Yeah. There will be a divorce somehow. You're going to die. They're going to die. They're going to get married. And the wife has a different energy than, than what you know brings a different energy to the relationship than you had previously, whatever it might be. But I think there's only so much you can do and also accept that, hey, this might be my springboard, but I'll be honest with you. And maybe you know somebody. I don't know anybody two things. I don't know anybody who has not had a failed partnership that's been in partnership. I don't know anybody. And two, yeah. I don't know anybody who, because of a failed partnership, was not able to have success. So for me, at least what I've seen is partnership is a tool. If it works, great, but plan on it not. And when it doesn't, you won't be so surprised. It's not a marriage, right? You're not in love. You're not, you're not swearing vows till death do you part. It is really about, can you and I propel each other to the next level? And then once we're standing on that mountain, do we each want to go to that same next mountain together? Yes or no. And make that decision. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely correct that, and maybe I'm biased because I grew up in a family of attorneys. I went to law school. I worked for a judge. <laughs> There are so many entrepreneurs that mess up so much by having such a flimsy uh, relationship. Uh, one of my best relationships and worst break breakups, I guess, um, I honored an email that I sent him, uh, which basically outlined it. And uh, our operating agreement didn't outline what I put in the email. And so I honored what I put in the email. Most people will not if it's mm -hmm. not a formal writing. I, I think that that's one of the 
most important things, even if you don't have a lot of money in the beginning. Talk a little bit about how you would help a person transition from being that employee, because not too many people are going to do what you did, which is just drop it and move to, or, you know, start a new career with us. We just sold everything and we said, you know, let's do a fresh start. We sold our business. We sold everything and we moved uh, to Central America. You, you're in the Dominican, you're in the Caribbean. How does a person who doesn't want to just drop it and start something new transition from that, uh, as you call the W2 into a entrepreneurial 1099 relationship with somebody? Yeah, I think I think the the number one is like I said before, I think you've got to have that community around you of who you're becoming. That's first and foremost. The other thing, this is a tactical thing that works for me. When I when I quit my job, I, I didn't intend to have this happen, but it became a tactic afterward. When I quit my job, I was on the way to Florida. Like you mentioned, in COVID with my job, I could do it from anywhere. So yeah. I talked to my boss and said, Hey, we're gonna go to Florida for a month. We lived in Michigan. It was February. It's cold. So we went to Florida. My wife and kids uh, flew down very comfortably. I drove for like two and a half days through ice and everything else in the north with my <laughs> That's dogs. That's the and, way it works, right? Right, yeah. My yeah. dogs and toys and everything else in the back. But it took like three days to drive from you know, lower Michigan to South Florida. And along the way, there was only like, I don't know, so many hours of podcasts or books or phone calls I could make before it became just like me in the road. And me in the road meant that my had I had to just start thinking and and my brain had to start working and it's uncomfortable like we're not I'm not used to that we're we're stimulated constantly phones friends family t- laptops tv whatever it might be so that that decomp that sort of detox of stimulation forced on me by just like I got to pay attention to what I'm doing the dogs don't talk so I guess I'm just thinking it really got me back of the napkin figuring out how I would quit my job it was always a dream and I was working toward it but I didn't imagine that I was ready so that time really got me to the point of being ready and then later I had a, a moment where I was like you know what it's time and I left but from that point forward every quarter my wife and I actually alternate this I execute what I call a solo weekend so this is three days alone, Friday through Sunday night at a hotel, in the woods, wherever you want to do it. But it's incredible if you set an intention for that weekend, you go into it with the, with the idea that you're going to sort of journal and meditate. Not even, you don't even meditate, just sit there quietly. Don't watch TV, don't watch Netflix, don't play on your phone, don't do any of that stuff. Like allow yourself to come down. Like Friday, you're going to really go through that. Like, ah, I want to pick up my phone and that's okay. As you get into Saturday and Sunday, it's amazing is how you just, you have an intention you're allowing your brain to just sort of relax and think. And then you're writing out stream of consciousness ideas and thoughts, how those random ideas and thoughts all of a sudden formulate maybe action plans or, or ways in which you can, or things that you hadn't thought of previously because you're always stimulated. So I think that's a really great way, no matter what it is, if you're looking to transition your role in your business, you're looking to leave your job, maybe it's leave this job for another company. Uh, leave your spouse. I don't know, but whatever, whatever it might be, big decisions. I think it's a great tactic and something that we don't do enough. You remember Aaron Rodgers went into like a dark sure. retreat, right? People yeah. vilified him. They crucified all oh, this psycho going into a dark room. Like when he went to the Jets, go <laughs> crawl back in your dark room. He's not going to want to play anymore. It's like, yeah, all right. You can they call him a hippie or whatever. But the idea of silence, I know it's woo. But the idea of silence is so foreign and we don't have it anymore that planning intentional time that way for me allowed me to really get my head around the possibility of something else, the possibility of quitting my job. So I think if I, if I take all of what we talked about, it's like you got to start something, whatever that is, buy the piece of real estate, start the business, partner with somebody, whatever, start something, knowing that you might pivot, probably will pivot. It's going to be a different version of you down the road. So that's one. Two is find the right community of people that normalize what you're becoming. And then three, give yourself some space to sort of integrate all of what you're getting from this new community and these ideas and this motion that you're in with this side hustle or real estate portfolio or whatever it is that you're buying. I think those three things together will really help people get a sense of like, you know what? I don't necessarily want to move to the Caribbean or to Central America, but I do want to leave. I want the ability to travel with my family. I want the ability to spend more time or just even have my day structured in such a way. That's all doable, I think, if you if you follow those those three elements. Well, Jamie, you uh, you're absolutely right. It's it's a matter of starting. It's a matter of then building on each of those different successes until you really start to have something significant that it's even better than what you could have imagined when you went into that dark retreat, as you just talked about. <laughs> Tell people where to find your podcast. 
Yeah, Tribe of Millionaires. You can find it everywhere on YouTube, on uh, Spotify, Apple, Apple Play, Apple Podcasts. I should say uh, it's a labor of love. I've got we do two episodes a week. One is a member of GoBundance, so it's kind of a high net worth men's entrepreneurial group. The other episode is somebody significant. Right after this, I'm interviewing Corey Dillon. Do you remember Corey Dillon? Sure. You do. You played for the Bengals, running back for the Bengals. Yeah. Yeah, four-time yeah. Pro Bowler. So he's yeah. coming up right after this. I like talking to really, really interesting people on peak performance. So that's what it's about. Well, I think the peak performance is where it's at. So why don't you finish with, uh, I'll give you the last word here. Uh, what is peak performance and how can people start to, uh, how to get there? Peak performance, I, you know, I would call it, I would call it flow. And I think Stephen Kotler, Stephen Kotler, who's written a bunch of books on the subject, says it best. In order to get into a flow state where you're in peak performance, you first have to have struggle. And then once you've, once you've, uh, uh, once you've, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Once you have accomplished that struggle, there's another word there, uh, release, you get into flow and then recovery. So anything that you're, you're doing, there's going to be struggle. And once you master it, that's the word you release, you get into a flow state. So you're rolling. And then once you're done, after you're done, you know, with whatever it is you're doing, you release from there. So I think those four elements of flow really speak to how you get and how you achieve peak performance. I think that's great. doesn't matter what you do. You're going to have the struggle. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. You're going to have the struggle before you become a master of it. Uh, Jamie, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, I look forward to listening to more of your, more of your podcasts. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me.